Thank you for choosing Access On Demand. Access believes in continuing education, and we create content to empower you to learn and grow anytime, anywhere. Let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Bob Holly with Home Healthcare News. I'm excited to host today's webinar, Maximizing Staffing and Scheduling Solutions in the New World of PDGM. As we all know, recruitment and retention are already huge issues. Uh, those points are only going to become more important under PDGM. Today's webinar is being sponsored by home health technology and solutions company, Access, and we have a couple of really great leaders from Access as today's presenters. Before I introduce David and Tammy, I wanted to go over a few quick housekeeping items. To start, please note that phone lines have been muted for sound quality. We should have time for questions toward the end, so please write in your questions using the question box on your screen during the presentation. We'll do our best to get as many questions as uh, in as we can. Uh, and then lastly, today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent via email afterward along with the slides. Tammy Ross is the Senior Vice President of Professional Services at Access, the fastest growing home health, home health care technology company. She oversees the Professional Services Division at Access with a focus on practical operational solutions for the home health, home care, and hospice sectors of the post-acute care industry using technology. Prior to joining Access, Tammy served as an executive consultant at Fazzy and Associates, where she used her years of home health leadership experience to assist clients in clinical and operational strategic planning and development. Also joining Tammy on today's webinar is Access Executive Vice President David Merck, who is also the founder and CEO of Home Health Gold, which has been providing Medicare certified agencies with extensive data analytics and OASIS scrubbing tools for over 20 years. Prior to launching Home Health Gold, David worked for 11 years as president and CEO of a large VNA in central Maine. In March of 2018, David joins the management team at Access Technologies as part of the acquisition by Access of Home Health Gold. Tammy, David, thanks so much for joining us today. And with those introductions, I want to turn this convo over to Tammy. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. We're just going to start with our next slide and kind of just look at some things that are out there about staffing now. Um, pull this directly off of Glassdoor and Career Builder. Um, some things that our staff are saying about the home health industry. I love my patients, but after six months of staying up till 10 o'clock at night, I finally had to leave. Advice to management, relief of stress for field staff. Better training for employees. Documentation requires too much time, too many changes. As we approach PDGM, we know that's going to be a big one. The training is poorly structured, orientation is inadequate, and paperwork is lengthy. If we'll go to the next slide, we'll see what this leads to. Staff have increased workloads. They tend to turn over. They, they say that the documentation requirements, the drive time, and the surges in workload is what contributes to that turnover. Administrative staff, those DCSs, clinical supervisors, they say that they're doing the work of two people. They're, they have the work of administration, plus they're covering field staff. They say that they're leaving because they're just too fatigued and there's no work-life balance. We'll go to the next slide. And we'll just look at what that cost for turnover is. Cost for turnover ranges from about $37,000 to about $58,000. As we approach PDGM, it's going to be very important that we retain our staff in order to drive those costs down. And as we look at our objectives on the next slide, we're going to talk a bit about what PDGM basics are. We'll talk about a case study. David's going to present some real live data. Um, on a, a very large agency. And then we're going to talk about how scheduling op optimization and staffing using mobile technology can help improve these uh, kind of um, challenging times under PDGM. We'll talk about telehealth and then we're going to talk about supplemental staffing using the new generation home health aids. If we'll go to the next slide, I'll let David take it from here. Thank you, Tammy. 
Uh, I'm going to start by reviewing some basics of PDGM. As you know, uh, many of you have heard, there's a, a change for, under PDGM from a 60-day payment period to two 30-day uh, payment periods, all within a given 60-day um, episode. So there's a distinction on now in the use of those words. Episode applies to 60 days. Payment period now applies to 30-day periods. The rate currently in force, the national standardized rate is $3,154 uh, for PPS. Going into PDGM, the, the projected rate is $1,753 per 30-day period. If you double that, it's more money. However, remember that under PPS, uh, the, there is an add-on for non-routine supplies, which can add as much as $570 to a uh, payment for a 60-day for a period. The actual rate will be set in 2020, and one of the bones of contention right now is that that $1,753 figure includes a behavioral adjustment of 6.4%. CMS figures that when people see new rules for payment, they will find ways to, um, as the saying goes, game the system. And when they do that, uh, they will get more money than they're entitled to. Uh, consequently, they want to take off 6.4% right at the beginning. Uh, a lot of folks feel like perhaps that's the decision that should be made if that behavior uh, pops up rather than assuming at the beginning that it will. Whatever the rate is in, in both systems, PPS and PDGM, the dollar figure is handled the same way. It's factored uh, by the labor rate for the area in which the patient lives, and it's also um, affected by the case mix based on the uh, resource grouping that a patient is assigned to. So on the next slide, we'll take a look at the um, way that case mix is put together. Under PPS, the case mix involves uh, the, the very familiar clinical, functional, and service domains. The service domain no longer exists under PDGM. Under the clinical domain, the determination is made from OASIS data uh, for multiple items on the OASIS assessment. Under PDGM, the clinical uh, severity is determined strictly by the primary diagnosis for the uh, episode. Uh, the non-routine supplies are built in under PPS, but not under PDGM. Under PPS, there are 153 categories. With PDGM, it gets a little wild. There are 432 different categories. Partly this is because, again, 30-day periods, with the first 30 days and the second 30 days vary in some particulars, but uh, they each are governed by the same OASIS assessment, so they, in fact, uh, uh, are all, what you're doing is doubling the group um, by dividing it into 30 days. The um, most, most of the data used for the calculation of case mix under PDGM is taken from claims data rather than OASIS data. Functional severity is the exception. However, with the information that's on an OASIS, you can pretty, do a pretty good approximation of how things are going to turn out by looking at things like M1000, which tells you whether the person came from an institution or not, uh, and uh, looking at the diagnoses that are on that. One added feature in PDGM is the comorbidity adjustment. And this is based on secondary diagnoses on the claim, and we'll talk about that more uh, later. On the next slide, when we're talking about episodes, whether they're 30 or 60 days, we need to talk about lupus. And one distinction under PDGM is that the lupa visits, the visits are calculated on a 30-day basis. There's a threshold currently in effect of five visits uh, for a 60-day period. If you do five visits, you're paid for the entire 60 days. If you do fewer than that, you're paid on a per visit basis. Under PDGM, there are thresholds for each each of the four the 432 categories has a specific threshold. 
So you might have a first 30 days where the threshold is three visits and a second 30 days in that same episode where the threshold is uh, two visits. Invariably, the first uh, the threshold for the first 30 days is higher than that for the second 30 days. It gets a little fancier though because those threshold those visit thresholds can vary from two to six. You can there are there are situations where the the threshold for the first 30 days is six visits and the threshold for the second 30 days is five visits. That means you would have to do 11 visits at least and have them split properly between those two 30-day periods in order to avoid a LUPA impact. Again, LUPAs are calculated on each 30-day period. Next slide, please. The form on the right, I, the, the, the image on the right, I hope, is pretty familiar with all of you because it's a part of virtually every presentation that's done on PPS and PDGM. What it does is show how those various determinants of case mix are, are, uh, are combined. On the left, you see what the comparable picture would be under PPS. And again, you see clinical, functional, and service. And uh, with the service function utilization domain now no longer uh, separately identified. Under PDGM, you see that you're going to have community early or late can have institutional status early or late, four possibilities there. And then when you look at the principal diagnosis, the primary diagnosis, as I mentioned, that's a major determinant on the clinical domain. And in this instance, it's in this uh, most recent iteration of P PDGM, it's broken into 12 possible categories. So then you combine those possibilities with three levels of functional impairment, again, based entirely on OASIS items, low, medium, and high, and comorbidity adjustment, none, low, or high, and end up with your 432 categories. Next slide, please. In some ways, if you look at this, Given the intent of CMS to reduce gaming and to shift pri payment to certain priority groups, um, you can see that they've made a major, uh, a reasonable effort. But it's a major change that will affect each agency differently. It'll affect employees differently. Um, there's a lot of concern right now about what it means for physical therapists, uh, given the fact that. Um, High utilization of physical therapists is not rewarded any further, any longer in the system in the way that it was in the past. Uh, and accordingly, it's really necessary to take a look on an agency by agency basis at what um, what will happen. The CMS made an effort to do that, and they put out a spreadsheet which many of you may be familiar with, called an ag uh, agency level impact uh, study. They showed every agency that they had data for, over 10,000 agencies, and they showed what their revenue was in 2017, and then what the revenue would be for those same episodes of care, those 60-day periods, if the two 30-day payment periods in each were um, assigned dollars based on the PDGM formula. When they were all done, they said that it was a it was clear that it was uh, a revenue neutral solution. That there was 16.2 I think billion dollars for the first um, for the PPS and 16.2 billion dollars uh, for for um, revenue for PDGM. What they didn't do is they didn't take account of a major factor: the um, way in which diagnoses are assigned and they had several other adjustments that they made that as a result uh, raised some serious questions about the quality of that work um, so what we're going to do is look at an example on the next slide that uh, shows you uh, how this can uh, be a little the, the cms output could be a little misleading in this particular system we see uh, that there is uh, 
a, a PPS and a PDGM uh, disk, that on the PPS side, you see two possible payment outcomes, that either you're paid for the full episode or you're paid for uh, on a loop of basis uh, for that episode. Under PDGM, it's more complicated. You have the situations where you have the lupas, and you have the situations where you're paid for in full for both 30-day periods. But you also have a situation where you pay for just 30 days, and that's the situation that results if the patient is discharged in the first 30 days. If the patient is discharged in the first 30 days, you don't uh, collect additional uh, reimbursement for the second 30 days. And similarly, also not included under PPS, but definitely included under PGM, is a situation where you don't get any payment at all. And that's because of something called questionable encounter codes. That is that your diagnoses just flat don't work. So on the next slide, we'll talk about that a little bit. In the last slide, we saw that that was serious money that had resulted in a shortfall of about $66,000. The reason was primarily that the diagnoses which were being used for many episodes uh, as the primary diagnosis were diagnoses which would not allow the determination of a grouping. Now, it's not an unreasonable thing for, for CMS to want to clean up some of the diagnosis coding. A lot of the codes, that are, many of the codes uh, that were eliminated as viable primary diagnoses are what are called uh, symptom codes. They're codes that begin with the letter R. And there's a large number of those currently in use, commonly in use, and there are, there are things that describe things like muscle weakness or whatever. When you give CMS the word that it's muscle weakness, they don't really have any way to figure out what resources you're going to need to do whatever it is you're going to do to deal with that issue. You have to have, they, ha they have to have more information. In addition, a lot of the diagnoses uh, include the word unspecified, and that lack of specificity is such that they really, again, don't feel that they've gotten the information they need to assign a grouping. So it's not unreasonable, but it needs to be mentioned. It needs to be known. And it needs to, to and this is because it turns out that it's a significant percentage of episodes. Uh, in our work uh, through Home Health Gold, looking at uh, individual agencies, we have seen frequently, you know, routinely uh, 15 to 25 percent of the episodes uh, currently in play are ones that contain a, uh, that have as a primary diagnosis a, um, a questionable encounter code. And when you look at it on an agency by agency basis, you see a massive loss of money in this particular instance here. Uh, you see 574 of those where there was, on average, $3,000 uh, per episode being paid, suddenly gone. So you've got suddenly you've got a 19 or a 1.9 million dollar loss. Let's go to the next slide. We've talked about that particular outcome, the the questionable encounter codes uh, issue. Second kind of thing I mentioned was the um, the situation where you're paid for only 30 days. Uh, this is a situation where the money that you get um, is not ha not normally half of what a, a full 60-day payment period would be, because normally that first 30 days is a start of care. Often it's an institutional, or at least more than 50% of the time it's a institutional referral, those things cause it to get significantly more money. So you're getting, uh, you're getting a loss, but it's not as severe a loss as if last year's payment was just cut in half. Uh, and it, it, uh, but all the losses add up. Let's go to the next slide. Third possible outcome is that at least one period is a lupa. Now, Here's a case where I think CMS has also done, a, you know, in addition to not mentioning the, the primary diagnosis issue, um, where they could have been helpful by and been more candid about lupus. They say lupus will be reduced. I have not seen an example yet where that has occurred. I don't believe that they will. If you think about it, 
what our what our the, the CMS's position stated that episodes which were lupus previously would now qualify for reimbursement under PDGM. That can only happen with last year's lupa, which by definition has four, three, two, or one visit. If the lupa threshold for the particular herd is two, and that's a very small percentage of the episodes that are in play. Uh, so there won't be a lot of gains. What there will be is uh, a lot of situations where you did well over four visits and now have that being at least partially a lupus cir um, circumstance. Keep in mind, you can have a lupus for the first 30 days and full payment for the second. You can have, the, that's not very common, but it could happen if the patient came in and then immediately went in the hospital and then came back uh, and had enough visits to continue care or, or came back for treatment and had enough visits in the second 30 days to qualify for full, full payment. Um, <clears throat> you can have a case where it's the normal, which is uh, normal payment in the first 30 days and lupa in the second 30 days. And then you can have the situation where both payment, both uh, payment periods are uh, treated as a lupa. Lupus, uh, in my estimation, will be significantly higher. I would guess that they will be more in the 12 to 15 percent range based on what I've been seeing from agencies at this time. Um, and again, remember, one of the key differences is that it's calculated on a basis of 30 days. Let's go to the next slide. The last possible outcome um, is going to provide some relief, and that is a situation where you're paid in full for both 30-day periods. You had more than the lupa level for each of those periods, uh, and the patient was not discharged early. So you've got uh, as much as a 20% higher rating uh, payment than you would have had previously. Commonly, about 40 to 50% of an agency's episodes, Medicare episodes that I have seen, uh, are treated in this manner. So there are, this is, this is sort of the plus situation. However, remember that how things work can change to significantly depending on those clinical groupings. And where CMS has changed those groupings such that rehab and neuro have significantly lower case mix than they might have in the past, we now have a situation where you can, have, I can look at some reports and see agencies with Full pay where the where the total dollars for the full pay for both period situations is actually less than it was before, even though uh, the dollar rate is higher. It's the case mix that gets those pulled down. Uh, next slide, please. So an impact uh, study. Uh, Taking a look at the uh, all of these together, it's important to kind of note general things that I think are generally the case. You got lupus somewhere in the 10 to 15 range. Um, this is a situation with a 9.5, which is, in my estimate, low for for PDGM, but they were exceptionally low uh, for their uh, PPS uh, at the, um, lupus level. Somewhere around 28 to 30 percent are, um, uh, no, excuse me, somewhere around 21 percent is a reasonable expectation for the cases where there's full pay for just 30 days. And somewhere around 40 to 45 percent, sometimes as high as 50, is a good estimate for uh, full pay for 60 days. Again, it varies tremendously depending on the mix of patients that you've been working with. And so taking a look at this and Let's go to the next slide. Uh, looking at it by case clinical grouping uh, helps a lot. Looking at your particular patients, you know, this is a situation in this particular agency where a uh, very high loss is experienced for rehab and a, a loss for neuro, and sometimes I've seen that a good bit higher. Good money received for complex and for wounds. Um, and then the MMPA uh, 
are all generally getting more money. Uh, again, neuro and rehab are the areas that, that uh, consistently get hit the hardest. If we go back a slide, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Um, what we generally notice is that if the um, if if these dollars if if this was not there, if you had uh, proper diagnoses for everything, that the dollars would tend to balance out, and that's exactly what CMS showed in their impact study. So you've got a significant gain here for full pay uh, for 30 days, uh, loss for the other two categories, and sometimes higher, sometimes lower. Again, depending on the clinical grouping, uh, but overall across agencies. I think that would, would pretty well balance out. But that $1.9 million off the top at the beginning is going to hurt. Let's go forward two slides. So overall, on impact, there are great, uh, there's a great risk of losses. It's particularly true for the diagnoses. Um, there's a significant increase in lupa episodes. And there's a, a significantly greater billing effort that will be required. Now, I haven't mentioned that before, but the the billing uh, and and those three points are exactly the opposite of what CMS said would happen. They said it would be revenue neutral. It would be a reduction of lupas. Their estimate was from 8.0 down to 7.1 as a national average, and that there would be uh, no impact from on the billing side. Think about the billing situation. You've got two periods you have to bill for. You have to send in a wrap and then a final bill for each of those. Even if your agency is brand new in 2019 and is not eligible for wrap payment, you have a, to send in a wrap claim with uh, no pay expected at the front end of each of those two 30-day periods. So literally double the billing uh, claims forms that have to go in. Beyond that, you have the situation um, which is uh, uh, which is that that you can have things happen in the first 30 days that will cause recalculation of the second 30 days from what you expected. An instance would be the person has some other significant injury during that first 30 days and uh, goes into the hospital or goes into the emergency room, rather, uh, whatever, uh, and gets some new diagnoses and some new treatment plan. You've now done all that within the first 30 days. The patient comes back to you, and in the second 30 days, you adjust the bill for the new diagnoses. That's an extra piece of work that has to happen. That can happen even without a hospitalization. There's an old form uh, version of the OASIS sitting around that seldom gets used these days, but that many of us are very familiar with, and it's used from about 15 years ago, and that is the significant uh, change in condition, the O5 assessment. If you've got a patient who changes significantly in the first 30 days, and you process a significant change in condition, the information on that uh, can be used for and will be used if it's uh, processed through CMS, will be used to determine the, uh, the comorbidity, the uh, grouping, uh, the uh, uh, functional score, all of those things uh, for that second episode. That's a whole piece of processing that nobody has in place now. And um, so uh, basically, and then the other thing about the impact, uh, one last thought is that it does shift patients among patient, resources among patient populations. And you'll have to think through, how can I continue to get the outcomes for these groups that I've been striving for? And how can I do that with the resources that will be available? Sort of as a help for keeping track of this, let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, as you look at your stuff, th at your data, why don't you look at, at the following? These are a, this is a group of uh, key performance indicators uh, to monitor. Looper rate, 
the control of missed visits, uh, the OASIS functional scoring, as I mentioned, uh, that comes straight from the OASIS. So uh, are your people doing a thorough job in assessing functional need? Uh, loss of revenue, therapy utilization, increased billing demands. Are, are your billing folks getting ready to handle those multiple chores? Case management documentation, episode management, and intra-episode management in particular as it relates to um, uh, making sure that unnecessary lupas don't uh, land on your doorstep. Staff education and training, uh, which relates right back to those comments that Tammy mentioned earlier. Referral source and coding. Um, th that's a lot to keep an eye on, but this uh, PDGM really does change a great deal. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand things back to Tammy to tell you how to fix it all. I wish I had the answers to fix it all, but let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about how to mitigate some of these uh, risks. It's estimated that about 44% of agencies may have a loss under PDGM based on all the criteria that David just mentioned to you. Staff, staffing and scheduling platforms can help you decrease these risks and kind of control some of the challenges that we have under PDGM. The first one of those is going to be your loop of avoidance and control of those missed visits. Your second one is going to be your rehab management because this is David said, we're going to be expected to do more with less under PDGM, but those outcomes are still going to be expected. It's kind of like the old um, talk show that was named that tune. Um, you, you, I can almost hear someone saying, I can get that rehab outcome in six visits. Well, I can do it in five. Um, goes back to kind of value-based purchasing and, and seeing if we can produce the outcome with, with less resources. Program development, as you saw from the data analytics that David presented, um, wound care, complex nursing, it's going to pay at a much higher percentage than um, what it's been paying for under PPS. So this may be an opportunity um, to expand uh, your service offering, offerings and include one of these service lines. Um, decrease costs in general because we want to mitigate that potential revenue reduction. Maybe you're not among the 40, 44% that may have a revenue uh, reduction, but everybody likes a little bit more in their margins. So decreasing costs is always a good thing. Um, also growing revenue streams uh, through additional programs. And then um, OASIS functional scoring, because we know there's going to be some payment increases based on that scoring. Uh, when we look at OASIS, um, I like to look at that as, as medical necessity and homebound reasons. Um, and if we see a lot of low scores in OASIS, you wonder about, is this patient homebound? Is this a medically necessity, uh, necessary um, home health admission? The other thing about OASIS scoring is if you're scoring low all the time, there's no way to show improvement in outcomes. Uh, from, a, from a nurse perspective, which I am a nurse, and, and I know that putting my skills up against the PT skills with scoring OASIS, and you're going to see a very different scoring technique. Nurses tend to score OASIS by interview, where therapists tend to actually score by assessment. They're, they're trained to show me. So they'll get the patient up, they'll actually walk them, they'll watch them put on a jacket or a coat, take off their shoes. And oftentimes, they get a truer picture of that OASIS scoring than a nurse does by asking a question. So there's a lot of things we can start doing to prepare our staff now for OASIS scoring. We can have our therapists cross-train with our nurses um, and leverage um, their capacity to do OASIS scoring um, functionally at a better level than what we do as nursing staff. We could go to the next slide. So just looking at Lupa, and, and I think David made a great case for that, um, this is actually kind of how we do um, visit utilization now. 
You'll see a top across the top, 1 through 15 days, and days 16 through 30. And if I just take the skilled nurse visit and look at that, you'll see that we do our most intense visits during those first 15 days of care. And there's reasons for that. Patients are coming home from a hospital or a nursing home or maybe even from the community, and they have um, multiple issues, health indicators, mul multiple things going on with them. So we need to be more intense, and we've been taught to do that. We've been taught that this helps keep the patient out of the hospital if we go more frequently. And under PPS, that has not been an issue as far as payment. But under PDGM, if you look across the days and you look at skilled nurse visits, um, in the last uh, 30 days of the episode, so day 31 through day 60, you'll see that those, those visits go down. We're down to more like four and a half, 4.6 visits. So that's under PPS and that worked for revenue. Under PDGM, that may not work. Uh, David and I talked to an agency just recently that was doing a great job with their rehab management. They have gotten their outcomes up significantly, their functional scoring it was significant, and they're doing everything right. Um, their length of stay was probably just a little over 30 days, and in some cases just that 30 days. With PDGM, because they're meeting those outcomes quickly in the first 30 days and maybe in tapering visits in the last 30 days, they're going to be somewhat penalized financially for that. So under PDGM, this system that we're looking at here doesn't work very well for reimbursement. Let's look at the next slide. When we're talking about LUPA, I like to break it down to the dollars. What's the cost of a single visit? And the cost of a single visit, if we're looking at a five-day or a five-visit LUPA threshold using our 2019 rate, it's about $1,100, a little over, $1,167.68. That's the loss of one visit. What can schedule and platforms do to help you with that? We know we're going to have to start looking at things in 30-day segments. We're still a 60-day episode. But it's going to be very important that when we're thinking about scheduling, we schedule for 30 days. An example would be if you had um, a LUPA under PDGM that was um, six visits for the first 30 days. And, and maybe you're seeing that patient twice a week. Well, maybe your, your 30 days ends on, let's just call it um, May 30th. But the way you'd scheduled out your visit, you were doing a Monday, Thursday, and Thursday falls onto the next 30-day treatment period. So if we didn't have that 30-day calendar showing us that, that 30-day scheduling, we may go ahead and make that visit thinking, hey, I'm at my two times a week. I still have 60 days to go, not realizing we just created a LUPA in that first 30-day payment period. So having a 30-day view of a calendar, having a scheduling platform that's going to help us be able to schedule those visits thinking in 30 days is going to be essential for us under PDGM. It's going to be very hard to switch our thinking from that 60-day episode to those 30 days. So looking at scheduling platforms will be important. We could have the next slide. Also our outcomes. We Again, we want to start thinking about how are we going to get those really good rehab outcomes and possibly with less staff. As David mentioned, some of our, our physical therapists are getting very nervous about PDGM and what does that mean for them. They may be transitioning out of home care into um, other areas of employment. And that's going to uh, drive our pool of therapists down. Um, in addition, we know that we have surges in home care. We go up and down where we need more therapy visits. We need more nursing visits. We have those surges and um, start the care. It's often helpful to have supplemental staff that can help cover those gaps. 
So staff augmentation is going to be very important um, with PDGM. Something that allows us the ability to use um, multiple therapists maybe to cover a large geographic area, as well as multiple nurses. If we'll look at the next slide. There's a couple um, uh, things I want to point out with this slide. Just looking at our shift of where therapy visits are going, um, if you look at the blue uh, bar graph, this blue bar, bar graph is actually um, one of our agency's data that we've uh, de-identified. And this is kind of where their buckets are falling for therapy now. And you can see that that 14 to 19 and over 19 is where the majority of their utilization is for therapy. As they start to transition um, their plan, and I'm not saying that's a foolproof plan, but their plan for transition is to start moving into that red area where you're seeing more of those therapy visits drift to the one to five visits then over to the 14 to 19 visits. So we're starting to see a bit of a transition as people start gearing up for PDGM. And, and I, I, I think part of that is due to the fact that the agencies need to have some time to beta test how many visits can you do this in and still get a good outcome. So agencies are starting to see um, a decline in therapy visits. I think we'll see more of that towards the end of the year, but we're already seeing subtle shifts. And then if we look at the green, we also see um, what a PDGM picture may look like in February of next year. We're probably still going to have buckets over 19 and 14 to 19, but I suspect we're going to see an increase in those buckets of therapy utilization more at one to five visits as agencies attempt to be able to hit their outcomes with fewer and fewer therapy visits. Another possible trend for us is uh, utilizing CODAs and PTAs um, when we can in replace of PTs and OTs. Uh, next slide, please. Connecting to through profiles, uh, through technology, um, is going to be a, a great way to be able to provide that supplemental staffing it's going to be able to allow us to establish those connections um, through technology, um, a little bit like Uber is doing. Uh, that Uber model is going um, global and going through all service lines now. As we start to see Uber um, kind of um, technology models drifting into healthcare, we're seeing that we can connect a wide variety of people from all over with needs. Um, these needs can be targeted to skill sets. We can actually rank um, and see pictures of our staff. Um, we're able to know um, if they're a one, two, three, four, or five star clinician and actually drill down to their competency and see what their skill sets are. This is a great way to provide that supplemental staffing that's going to be needed in PDGM for kind of those ebbs and flows. And the other thing is to supplement your full-time staff that we often burn out by giving 120, 130% productivity uh, requirements when we have those surges and start the care. The next slide, please. As we look at developing programs, we can look for supplemental staffing and staff augmentation to help us do that. Um, oftentimes, as smaller companies and maybe some larger companies that maybe cover in rural areas or geographic areas where they don't have service connection, technology and staff augmentation can help us connect with individuals that has those skills in those geographic areas. I mentioned that complex nursing, IV, wound therapy are going to be um, very big players or payers in PDGM is maybe a better word. They're going to be high reimbursers. This may be areas that, that companies want to get into, that agencies want to grow those programs. Um, it's a great way to grow a program is to use that supplemental staffing and augmentation. 
And then you're able to kind of, um, I like to say, kind of try before you buy, before you invest a lot of money into the program. You're able to see how your referral resources are going to respond. Is this going to be a good model for your agency? Uh, what's the return on investment when you look at growing a wound care program? Because it's not just the revenue. We have to look at the cost as well. Um, one of my favorite service lines is management and evaluation of care plan. Um, I've been in home care for almost 30 years now, and I remember we used to do this still quite frequently before a little thing called Probe and Educate happened. Um, I felt like it was a, an excellent way to take care of that chronic population. That population that you think any minute might go back into the hospital. There's an underlying condition affecting what's going on. So as a nurse, I controlled all that non-skilled and managed all that non-skilled, those non-skilled factors that may affect um, that patient's health indicators. Um, it kept patients out of the hospital. Back then, we didn't track hospital rates. Back then, there was an oasis to track it with. but. But I feel like we kept patients in the home much longer. It's also a skill set that is not heavily, um, it's not heavy on nursing visits. It relies a lot on that non-skill, that more cost-effective labor like your home health aid. So management and evaluation of care plan using staff augmentation, you're able to reach out to nurses that may have that skill set and may be like me and absolutely love to perform that skill and know how to document that correctly. Uh, the other one is maintenance therapy. As we look at ways to keep our outcomes great but still drive our costs down, maintenance therapy may be a way to go. This is a skill set that where therapists manage the functional indicators or the functional leveling of these patients in order to keep them where they're at and to keep them from digressing and maybe having a fall and ending up in the hospital. We'll look at the next slide. So employee benefit costs versus 1099, that's something I'm asked quite frequently. You know, what's the best staffing model? What's the, you know, should we staff per visit? Should we do 1099 employees? Should we do full-time employees? And obviously, depending on your state, there's some limits to that and who can be 1099 and who can't um, based on the benefits that you have to pay out. But looking at 1099 employees, usually your nursing and your PT staff can be 1099 employees because they're at that professional level that labor law allows to be um, basically uh, independent contractors. And when we look at looking at nursing as the home health salary of about 78,000, uh, the cost for benefits for those employees are about 31%. So you add 31% on top of that 78. So if you save just one full-time equivalent by using supplemental staffing, it's about a $25,000 savings by using a non-employee or a 1099 um, person to staff your visit. Let's look at the next slide and we'll see how those numbers kind of break down and where we spend that money. Um, this is where we spend that money because the next thing is, well, what about PRN staff versus full-time staff? So I think it's important to know your benefits breakdown as an employer. You're going to pay about 6.2% in uh, Social Security, another 1.45% in Medicare, 9.65% in paid time off or other benefits. Um, and that can include time for documentation, team conferences. Um, insurance is going to be about a 9% and retirement savings about 5.4%. So that's how our numbers typically break down. If they're not full time, obviously you're not going to pay the paid time off insurance or retirement, but you're certainly going to pay the Social Security and the Medicare. And you're probably going to pay them to come in and do a uh, team conference and staff meetings. So you have to look at that time as well. Um, the next slide, please. So just repeating this slide again, too many changes. Workload is equivalent to two full-time jobs. I won't go over every one of these, but 
but just keep those in your mind as we flip to the next slide and we look at some data analytics. Here's what happens when staff get overloaded and overwhelmed. If we'll look at these data analytics from an actual case study, um, if you are the administrator or the CEO of this agency, you'd probably be pretty panicked right now. As you see that you have 435 non-admissions and 600 discharges. Um, this typically happens in staffing crisis um, and staffing challenges. What staff tend to do, they're trained clinically, is they triage. Um, they're going to take care of the patients with the greatest need and discharge those patients so that they can take care of patients with the greatest need. We call that load balancing. What that results in is, is a huge decrease in business and a huge decrease in revenue for agency owners, CEOs, and administrators. 435 non-admissions compared to 542 admits. We're giving away almost as much business as, as we're receiving. Let's look at the next slide. The other thing that often happens when clinicians are rushed and they're trying to do maybe three OASIS, four OASIS events a day is revenue often decreases. As you can see from this, we have a lot of areas in the red. This revenue is under $3,000, which isn't even the average. We would like for revenue to be at the national average, but with this agency, they had to set 3,000 even as their threshold because the revenue was so low for the agency. The other thing causing the low revenue is many, many loopas. We're missing many, many visits because of, again, the staff is short. Staff, uh, they're in a staffing crisis and the staff is load balancing. That's where staff augmentation comes into play. Let's look at our next slide. And then if we just see here the reason for non-admits as we drill those down, we can see this other category and we can see that um, not appropriate for home care. When I start seeing other or resources not adequate, or possibly even not homebound. These are categories that clinicians know they can put patients in, and they're usually not questioned. Um, so they're able to not admit patients if they don't feel that they have a, a huge need um, and they're trying to load balance. Look at the next slide. So what can we do to help with this besides staffing augmentation and, and scheduling? We can look at telehealth, and telehealth can be equipment or it can be the telephone. It's creating touch points, and what it's doing if you're using monitors, it's, 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 it will provide you empirical data which helps support those comorbid diagnosis. And either way, whether it's by telephone or telemonitoring, it's driving down your looper rate. If we'll go to the next slide, because what happens when you make contact with patients you often will find that there's a reason to go out and do a PRN visit. That PRN visit can be the difference in the LUPA and not a LUPA. Because oftentimes we're going to find that one of their healthcare indicators um, is outside of parameters. Maybe the blood pressure's up, maybe the weight is up, uh, maybe the blood sugar's up. So telehealth helps support the control of LUPAs. It also helps support our outcomes by using um, virtual videos. We can look at doing um, telehealth exercise programs for rehab. I know an agency that's looking to use a physical therapist to manage a lot of home exercise programs. And I don't know what that number is going to be. Is that going to be 60 patients? Is that going to be 50 patients? But they're still looking into that using uh, telemonitoring and being able to do um, virtual visits with the patients to drive the right rates down. You know, virtual visits will not count towards the LUPA um, reimbursement. I do want to add that, but hopefully you can use some uh, nursing or some um, home health aid staff to help supplement those visits. Let's look at the next slide. Um, using home health aid staff for management and evaluation of care plan, um, and, and using them to perform tuck-in calls 
It's often a good way, and we'll talk just a little bit, that next generation of home health days. It's a great way to detect early exacerbation and, again, control lupus by having touch points with the patients. Telehealth doesn't replace people, but what it does is create those touch points. Our next slide. And just looking at healthcare reform, this is just a reminder that Medicare agrees that management and evaluation of care plan and maintenance therapy are skills that beneficiaries can use under the home health benefit. It's up to us to make sure that we document those skills correctly. Our next slide. So management and evaluation concepts. Just know that a physician has to document the need from m and &E or management and evaluation. There has to be underlying conditions or complications. Non-skilled care has to be provided in the home by provider services, home health aides, or family members. And an RN, not an LPN, has to manage that case. For maintenance therapy, a PT versus a PTA has to perform that case. Our next slide, I'll talk a little bit what, about what we have to do to get there. It's that evolution of home health aids. We need to start looking as, at our home health aids to augment rehab, um, to be utilized as a home health aid that can do home exercise programs, that perhaps can be dementia coaches and M&E, that can do management and evaluation of care plan and be that non-skilled care that we use to manage this chronic population. And it's gonna add the value of improved outcomes. It's gonna improve patient satisfaction because generally patients enjoy their aids even more than they do their nurses and therapists. It's gonna improve staff and retention rates as it gives home health aids a career progression. And our last slide in summary, we just want to uh, say that PGM creates um, threats, but it also creates opportunities. It's up to us to seize those opportunities. And we feel like technology can assist mitigate those threats, those threats, both through data analytics and also through staffing solutions, scheduling solutions. And at this point, I think we have time maybe just for one or two questions. All right, Tammy, David, great presentation. Um, like you said, before any of this webinar, we maybe have five minutes or so for some questions. Um, before that, one quick reminder, in case you missed anything, audio and slides will be shared via email following the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, here's our first question. David, looks like it's for you. Is it possible to receive a lupa for both the first 30-day period and the second 30-day period? without the person going into the hospital? Uh, and if so, what does that do to reimbursement? Well, the, it, it absolutely is possible. The reimbursement for each of those 30-day periods is calculated using the LUPA formula. It's a, uh, a, a value, a revenue per uh, discipline kind of formula as opposed to revenue based on the full uh, episode of care. So you count up the number of episodes of uh, visits by particular disciplines. There's a bunch of other uh, factoring in there for which discipline was in the home first during that time period, um, and it's also treated by your case mix and your uh, labor rate. So it's a complicated little calculation, but basically uh, it is possible, and it's done in the same way that, that a calculation for a loop episode would be done now. And uh, and and not not demanding a uh, readmission in, in the meantime. Got it. Thank you for those insights. Uh, Tammy, looks like we have a question. Uh, this one's probably best directed towards you. Um, the the impact studies seem to show that questionable encounter diagnoses are the biggest threat. What can agencies do uh, to address this threat? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we have to start using PDGM codes now. We have to start getting our staff used to it. In addition to our staff, we have to get our referral sources used to it. This is going to be a huge demand on them to provide us the information needed to code so that we can get those specific codes that David mentioned. Um, it's going to take some time to get them to transition. Another thing I'll just briefly mention is 
you know, now's a good time for us to start uh, discussing care plan oversight again with our referral sources. As we start asking them to provide us more information, it's a good time to mention that, you know, there is reimbursement, um, an average of about $150 for a 30-day period uh, for 30 months for physicians for oversight in home care and hospice. So maybe if our, our referral sources understand that, you know, it'll be a true partnership to work to getting at these uh, codes that we need. And uh, maybe one more question here. Uh, David, this one's for you. Somebody's asking, I noticed that the rehab and behavioral health groupings have the largest percentage of negative impact. Why do you think that is? Um, clearly with rehab, uh, see, it, it, it's not an accident. CMS feels that they have been paying way more than was necessary to achieve the desirable outcomes uh, because agencies seeing that they would get more revenue have uh, increased the number of visits that they would do. Uh, that, that high level of utilization no longer affects revenue uh, and it's, it's dropped accordingly. I mean, in both cases there, it's a, case, a function of decisions by CMS on where they want to put the dollars. And regardless of how widespread or how accurate any of their notions are about um, the gaming and so forth, the fact remains that they have, have sought to reduce that those payments. All right, well, it looks like we are about out of time. Thank you to everybody who took the time to attend today's webinar, and thank you to Access for sponsoring, along with Tammy and David, for their expert insights. Uh, as one last reminder, you will be sent an email with a recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides. Uh, that's all for today. Have a great rest of, your, rest of your week, everybody. Thank you for joining our on-demand training today. Access is the only home health care technology company approved by the American Nurses Credentialing Center to offer continuing education credits and the most recommended home health software on software advice. You can watch more on-demand training videos through our industry-leading help center or at access.com where you'll find tutorials, blogs, white papers, and answers to frequently asked questions. Access. Empowering care anytime, anywhere.